is uh, this morning's session is um, to mark World Stroke Day that is coming up on Saturday. So very much focusing on the whole area of stroke with a particular focus on uh, the psychological impact and recovery from stroke from a more kind of psychological perspective. Um, the World Stroke Day campaign this year led by the World Stroke Federation is uh, uh, kind of focusing on a theme that they're calling precious time. So the um, idea around that is uh, to, to really kind of bring the concept of time to the fore when it comes to stroke. Um, uh, so the importance of being aware of stroke signs and symptoms and getting treatment, getting assessment as, as early as possible. And if you'd like to find out more about that campaign uh, and, and the involvement of Cree with this year's um, uh, World Stroke Day campaign, you can visit the website cree.ie and you'll be brought to where you can, you can find um, the section in uh, the website that focuses on uh, that campaign and, and, and lots of information around stroke in general. A little bit of housekeeping. So everyone is muted right now. Um, and that's best for kind of everyone's sound quality. Uh, um, our speaker, um, Dr. Tom Burke, will invite questions and interaction a little bit later. Um, and so you're welcome to take yourself off mute by um, hitting the little microphone in the bottom right hand corner of your screen um, to, to make a comment or to ask a question. Uh, but in general, uh, it's best to stay on mute. So when your little microphone has a, a line through it, then you know that you're on mute. So I'm delighted to welcome our speaker here this morning, um, Dr. Tom Burke, who is a clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist uh, based in the University of Galway and also with the stroke team in University Hospital Galway. Um, if anyone has any questions um, in general around any anything to do with your, 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 your heart and stroke health, you can always contact um, our um, nurse helpline uh, called HeartLink West. Uh, very much a national service and, and for, for all things to do with heart and stroke. Uh, you can contact us Monday to Friday, 9 to 5.30, and the number is 544310, or uh, uh, you can uh, email us on healthteam at cree.ie, and you'll see the number has just been put in the chat there, and all the information is always on our website as well. So I will hand over to, uh, to Tom, and thank you again for being here, and thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Lisa, um, and welcome everybody. And it's a, a great pleasure of mine to be here and to um, be discussing some of the psychological aspects of, of stroke and stroke recovery um, from both the cognitive, behavioral and more kind of clinical um, perspective. So I'm just going to share my screen here as so I have a couple of slides prepared um, just to go through. So um, can I just double check maybe with a, a thumbs up, maybe from, from Lisa. But yeah, you can see that. Perfect. Um, so, so it's quite a broad approach that I'm going to uh, take this morning in terms of the psychological aspects of stroke, <clears throat> because many people, as many people will know, there's just quite a varied, um, I guess, a varied way and response that, that people can have to stroke. Um, and I'm going to go through in terms of a bit of a background as to why that might be the case uh, for, for some people and then talk about some of the, the specifics. And of course, at any point, if you want to pop questions or comments into the chat, what I'll try and do is keep an eye on that as, as I'm kind of going through. Um, and then what we can do is have um, more of a, a discussion maybe afterwards or, or talk about some of the, the specific aspects. Um, so as Lisa mentioned, um, I'm based here part of the time in the University of Galway um, within the School of Psychology. And then the other part of my time is based in Galway University Hospital as part of the stroke team um, where I run the neuropsychological stroke service. Um, and my colleague Emmett Godfrey is uh, also one of the uh, psychologists based there. Um, so as I said, the overview of today is going to be kind of background um, in terms of some of the aspects of stroke that, that are useful to maybe cover before we talk about some of the specifics. Cognitive aspects of some of the thinking and just kind of um, behavioral uh, consequences of stroke. Some of the psychological aspects like anxiety, depression, um, and some of the more mental health components. And then things like individual and family-based supports um, in terms of what's available through the hospital and um, what's available through the community and what's available to you uh, generally in, in the public domain. So I'm just going to show a, a short, small infographic here which just outlines some of the vasculature of the brain. So it's the only one, um, or it actually comes in, it comes in in a quick second, <laughs> um, but I'll maybe just do the, the, the preview of it now. 
it's the only one that kind of has anything very uh, pictorial from a brain sense um, and it just highlights some of the the, the the vasculature in the brain to give people a sense of um, why stroke can be so varied unlike some other things which is a very classic kind of presentation. Um, so the neuropsychology stroke service in um, the UHG um, what we do is we look after kind of inpatient referrals so you may have met me or some of my colleagues um, as um, or through, through the inpatient service we also do an outpatient clinic for people which runs every week and then we also uh, support Merlin Park in terms of neuro rehabilitation and so what that looks like is when people are medically well and stable um, if they're an inpatient in Merlin Park we might support them with things like um, cognitive training um, or psychotherapeutic support for things like maybe anxiety or uh, low mood or, or kind of more mental health side. Um, so this is the vascular picture piece that I kind of just did a, a bit on. Um, and the reason I highlighted it is to kind of to show that people from, from a stroke perspective, there's quite a varied um, spectrum from, from quite small or quite specific strokes in quite specific regions to quite um, more vast or larger strokes. And this angiogram, cerebral angiogram on the bottom right, I think, is, is a nice... Um, picture of that. It, this is just the, the vasculature, even to the point where in the kind of bottom right, just around here, um, you might be able to make out the kind of the, the veins and, and vascular structure goes to the eyes. Um, so it shows you very much so that the very big kind of arteries down to the more small um, smaller components there. And so within a, a stroke and within some stroke syndromes, you can have quite, um, quite large bleeds or, or hemorrhagic or ischemic strokes. Um, as well as um, much kind of smaller ones. And within the brain in and of itself, there's various areas that hold things like cerebrospinal fluid that shouldn't have any blood or anything else in them. And um, for some people that can be the, the large part of their stroke syndrome is that after a bleed, it might be very small, um, but what they're, what they're left with for a good number of months, a year to two years, is, is kind of recovering from the fact that blood is in a space that it shouldn't be in the body, in the kind of cerebral spinal um, fluid, and the, the aqueducts and that kind of thing. Um, so when we talk about stroke, um, these would be kind of some of the main areas that we consider and think about from a, a psychological perspective, which includes neuropsychology and, and uh, clinical psychology. So the physical components, sensory components, cognitive, behavioral and emotional. And the latter three are what we're going to kind of focus on more so today. Um, so each of the different kind of parts of the brain typically have, have different um, functions and different things that they control and look after from our kind of ability to make decisions and problem solve here at the front to things like more standing upright and our kind of breathing regulation and heart rate, which is kind of more the, the base bottom cerebellar kind of stuff down here to our ability to produce language, for example, which is a bit more temporal. Um, so what we know from, from stroke or from stroke-based um, studies and presentations are things like if somebody has a particular bleed to a particular part of the brain, that's naturally what, what then leads to the clinical presentation that we see, which might be more of a difficulty with some of the cognition in terms of producing language, maybe some of the more motor side of things um, or, or more um, psychological um, outcomes. So just a little bit on the, on the, the, the data, um, cognitive changes are quite common after strokes, so up to 80% of people can present with a, a type of a cognitive impairment. Um, and that's quite a broad um, statement. So that includes things like memory, concentration, attention, speed of processing. Um, in a recent study we, we did here in Ireland from everyone that we assessed, it was a very similar um, number. It was kind of nearly up to 80% of people had, had some difficulty. Um, there's also the functional consequence and function is, is probably one of the main things that we try and support. So, so that our ultimate outcome really is to support people from a functional point of view. And in order to do that, we then consider things like the cognitive profile and um, the behavioral side of, of, um, of, of post kind of stroke syndromes. And then other things here like personal, family, occupation and, and social domains and see how can we support somebody at, at the end. Um, Often people will experience or report um, behavior changes. So this might come from a person themselves, or it may come from their, their family, a carer or a companion. Um, it, it's quite common typically because the frontal parts of the brain are, are usually affected. And that's typically what, what helps us to kind of um, regulate some of these things like aggression or impulsivity or distractibility. Um, we do a lot of um, assessment on this front in terms of our outpatient clinic and our inpatient work in the hospital. Um, 
So these are just some of the ways that we we try and uh, do that. In terms of, of behavior, typically we think of it as a form of communication. Um, so if, if there's a kind of a behavior that, that we're kind of working with, we're usually trying to figure out what's the person trying to communicate to us or tell us, or how can we support them to, to let us know what their, what their needs are a different way. Um, I'm just going to very briefly touch on some of the cognitive and kind of neuropsychological features. And, and the reason for this is that typically what we find in the clinic um, when somebody comes in to meet myself or Emmett in the outpatient clinic, we, we will often describe some of the, the things that people are talking to us about in these ways. And it can be very useful for people to say, oh, actually, I didn't realize that was a certain thing. And, and now I kind of I have a name for it and I can kind of work with it. So I just thought from from um, one of the, the reviews that we, we were published recently, um, I just thought it might be of interest to briefly share some of this with you. Um, and so essentially what we found in doing the systematic review of all the literature was that the kind of those frontal parts of the brain, the executive function, had the largest um, rate of impairment. So that problem solving, that being able to think things through, to inhibit and, and that kind of thing was, was quite large. We know that those functions support memory. So it's not surprising for us then to see that memory also has quite a large um, impairment rate. Um, so this is at, at a moment in time, not necessarily uh, permanently, but up to 60% of people had uh, had a, some form of a memory difficulty, probably because their problem solving wasn't, wasn't fully there. And we can break that down further into what does that look like and what tests do we use, which we don't need to go into here at the moment, but you can review back on this if you want um, to have a look later. But essentially, those kind of problem solving frontal components are very, very important. Um, and that is a knock on effect in terms of daily living um, and, um, and therapy and, and those kind of things. So, so we'll, we'll circle back to those. Um, the, the study that we did was in conjunction with Beaumont Hospital um, at the time. So it was run through a number of, of services, Beaumont UCD, supported by the charity Friends of A. Um, and so there was a number of people involved, Prof Niall Pender, Prof uh, Moses Davenport, Prof Al Carr. Um, and again, coming at it from very different angles, from a kind of a clinical psychology perspective, from a neurosurgical perspective, and um, from a neuropsychological perspective. So essentially, a lot of these tests that we used um, were, were, were um, all coming back to domains of interest. So I no. won't um, hold on to this um, no. slide too, too long. No. But, um, yeah, sorry, I just need that person there. That's okay. They were just walking out of there. Um, so there's a number of tests. They're, they're very domain specific. So sometimes when you come and see us in the clinic, um, we might ask you to do a 10 or 15 minute kind of screener. And the reason we do that is, is what we're looking at are these big domains here on the end of the bubble. Um, this battery within the bubble would probably take about three hours to do. Um, so just, just to kind of contextualize why sometimes if you're doing a screen or two, this is the reason, because if we see a little bit of something that, that we can support you with on the outside of the bubble, we know then to go in a little deeper and do a little bit more of, a, of an assessment. Um, again, what we found when we did this was that the main areas of, of impairment that people struggled with the most were these kind of executive functions, so front to lobe things, they're getting new information in and they're holding on to it. And again, that's really useful for us in designing uh, therapeutic interventions and knowing how to support somebody therapeutically um, and supporting people at home to support people in a therapeutic context. Um, again, this is just that kind of broken down a little bit more. And just what you can see on the outer ring is, is what we would describe as a healthy control group. So people who haven't had a stroke. And so this is what we found when we compare people in a matched age kind of a way. So we asked people who did have a stroke to take part in the study. Um, as you can see, there's quite a lot more impairment in, in that group, um, up to nearly the 80% that I mentioned. And then on the outer group, we can still see that about 20% of people did have some kind of impairment. And that's why usually you might see if people are doing research or if you get in, invited to take part in research, that's why we, we ask people as well who don't have a stroke syndrome so that we can kind of figure out well what's the expected rates of, of difficulties and that kind of thing. So the psychological features, so I thought it might be useful to put up a bit of a formulation here. So this would be a kind of a classic um, post-stroke type of a, a psychological formulation and, and the reason I do this is, is to kind of highlight to people when they do see somebody in terms of like seeking support or, or if they're attending a clinic or a service, it's, it's to know that all of these things are on the cards essentially to, to talk about. And um, so if, if somebody maybe doesn't ask you about a particular area, you can bring it and say, listen, I'm having a little bit of difficulty with this. How, how can I be supported? Um, so 
the, the one I started with was the, the functional consequence. So that there's usually a very clear line between something happening like a stroke and then something being uh, more difficult, like a, a functional outcome, whether that's a relationship or work or something that you enjoy kind of doing. Um, you know, we can kind of do a very clear linear from pathology to consequence. Um, these are some other things then that from a, from a psychological perspective that we, um, we try and consider uh, as we're doing it. So the impact on things like insight, um, this is going to kind of unravel bit by bit. Um, insight, the cognitive profile, so again, whether it's doing something like screening tools or something quite brief to something um, more in-depth, like the kind of two, three hour kind of battery. Um, we know that the pathology will impact the cognitive function, which will ultimately impact the, the function. Affect, so, so more the, the mood, mental health side of things, depression, anxiety, uh, anger, confidence, motivation, all things that, that can be discussed and, and considered in terms of a, a psychological formulation for, for support. Um, the physical complications or physical consequence of something like a stroke. Um, so that breaking these down a little bit as things like maybe weakness in the body, um, a visual impairment or, or loss that way, difficulty with speaking or swallowing. Um, or kind of a pain syndrome as a, as a result. Um, so I just having a quick check on the chat there just to see if any of this is just in relation to the other thing. No, just people being helpful to each other, which is great. Um, <laughs> I just close that. Um, so then other things we consider then is, is like that, the pre-morbid factors, so things like, like how would someone co have coped with stress beforehand? So, so before the stroke or the stroke syndrome in particular, what was their natural coping style? And then how can we support that? Or how can we, um, you know, help somebody to, to kind of use their strengths and like they would have normally done in the face of something that's probably so out of the blue, so unexpected um, and, and then affecting all of these kind of things. And of course we do that in, con in conjunction with family and family support and companion support um, in as much as, as we can where possible. Um, so in the clinic, for example, what, what we started doing in our outpatient clinic is reserving slots specifically for, for family members and for social support um, pe uh, members. So, so not necessarily just people um, who may have experienced the stroke directly, but we're, we're incorporating specific family support um, clinics and that kind of thing again to, to try and support people on a holistic systemic level. Um, this, this is one of the questions that comes up quite a bit. So I just thought I'd pop a, a quick slide in on it. Um, whether something like depression or anxiety or, or some of the mood side of things are in response to a stroke or whether they're caused by the stroke. Um, and this is something that, that we, we tease out with people um, in a very much so one-to-one -one basis. Um, but, but it's very useful to have the, the ideas in your mind. I guess for, for some strokes, depending on where they are, if they're a little bit more on the left side or a little bit more on the front, what we can see is a bit more of what's kind of referred to as an organic depression. Um, where, where there's a depression happening as a result of the brain injury or the brain insult. And so we certainly would still work with somebody and, and work with the depression, but, but the cause of it is, is a little bit different. Um, this is compared to something like a reactive depression where somebody as a consequence of having a stroke is, is now feeling lower mood, they, their function is reduced, and it's, it's a little bit more of a, a reactive process. Again, we still very much so work with, with that side of depression, but how we, how we tackle it or how we come to it is is a slightly bit different. Um, so we asked people about this. So we, we, we interviewed people as part of that study I mentioned previously. And just rather than kind of either doing questionnaires or different bits, we, we invited them to come to interviews and, and ask them. And this is the kind of themes that were pulled out of it. So, so triggering event is referring to a neurovascular event or stroke. Um, and then these are some of the the, the kind of grouped things that, that people talked about, this kind of feeling of kind of enter, entering the unknown, the, the suddenness, the suddenness of, of things, the uncertainty, how, describing a new normal, um, which, which I'm, I'm sure people can relate to on, on the call, um, moving into a kind of a vulnerability space, so kind of on the path to recovery, but not knowing necessarily where, where things, uh, where the goalposts are for recovery and trying to navigate that, which is a, an exceptionally strong space for somebody to be in. Um, but, but a very difficult space. And then that kind of moved in, through the recovery journey then. So if you follow this around kind of like a, a clock kind of thing, um, into a sense of kind of maybe being more on a recovery pathway, having a sense then of kind of connectedness, whether that was with kind of the teams and in terms of the healthcare teams, 
um, creating new contacts interpersonally. So again, that was kind of through things like charity uh, supported networks, like social support networks. Um, people described a lot of role change, whether that was from a family perspective or them themselves. Um, and then kind of moved on to this um, final kind of theme, which was around things like kind of choice, power and control that, that for some people, they, they felt quite a level of agency uh, towards the end of their um, their kind of recovery journey as we, as we were kind of mapping it and, and calling it. Um, and, uh, and then we just described um, some of these in, in, in a little bit of detail. So in terms of support then, so, so I guess the reason for that kind of the background to some of the stroke stuff in Ireland is, is to describe then when we come to things like support, what we can do and, and why it's so individualized and, and that kind of thing. Um, so people will typically know of, of two avenues of support, one being a kind of a, a more medical type support in terms of medication, and one being more of a therapeutic type support when it comes to the psychological side of things. Um, so where, where that's kind of at in, in terms of the moment is we often do these things called randomized controlled trials or, or CTs to make sure that when we do an intervention, it's, it's better than not receiving the intervention. So um, so it, it's a controlled kind of a trial and things like medication can be shown to be quite good. Um, equally, things like therapeutic interventions or cognitive and behavioral therapy can be shown to be quite, quite good. Um, but the, there's still a lot of ongoing kind of trials for, for things like CBT. So, so typically things like CBT, as highlighted here, will focus on things like challenging thoughts um, and, and some of those kind of processes, which can be useful for some people. Um, but not useful for everybody kind of post-stroke. Um, we often talk a lot about kind of grief counselling in terms of loss, and um, that can come in the, function, in the form of things like loss of function, loss of autonomy, loss of a sense of self, as well as the more, I guess, kind of um, well-considered um, type of loss, which is more of a bereavement um, side of, of loss, which of course can, can also be the case for, for some people. Um, what, we're, what we try and do in, in the clinic in vivo is, is to essentially take some of the stuff that we know from CBT and, and apply it if it works for the person. Um, and, and if and when it doesn't, we take a different approach called ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy. And what that kind of looks at is kind of the third bullet point here, really. It's, it's looking at the differences kind of between maybe where somebody wants to be and, and where they ought to be and, and where they would have been pre-stroke and looks at how can we help them live in line with, with those same values that were there in, in the context of the stroke. So some things may simply not be um, possible post-stroke. Um, and if that's the case, well, how do we live in line with that? And, and an example of that might be something like if somebody has maybe a, a physical component to their stroke, um, but maybe they really value something along the lines of maybe being a, a parent or being a, 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 you know, a good parent or, or being a good husband or wife, kind of, a, if, if that's their value system. Um, what we try and do is, is figure out, well, how can you still live in line with that value system, even though you might have um, more physical difficulties now or, or, um, or those kind of things. So it's very much so value-based and, and looking to, to help people live in line with those value systems. Um, there are different kind of supports that are available, both kind of formally and informally. Um, so things like CRE in terms of the, um, the workshops and the support um, networks and services, and even the, the ones that Lisa mentioned at the beginning are um, brilliant supports available to people. Um, things like a GP are, are a great um, source of support because your GP can make a, kind of ongoing referrals to, to more formal services, um, which is always good to know about. And sometimes people may not be aware that services, for example, the bullet point here on primary care, that they're available to people through the GP. So um, the so primary care psychology is, is, is local services. And what they typically do is kind of six to eight sessions with people. Um, so they're classically considered as a kind of a, a mild to moderate kind of group. Um, and, uh, and, and GPs can refer into, into primary care. Um, so it's good to know that those services are, are available to you. If we go back up the bullet point kind of chain here, um, I mentioned just the kind of things like the workshops and, and the one before that, I, I quite like this um, this kind of center here. It, it's, it's run through Beaumont Hospital, but it's called the Mindfulness and Relaxation Center. Um, and the reason that I, I like it is because it's it's got a lot of resources um, and it's all clinician led resources that are, that are kind of evidence based. So, that, so they're guided practices that you can do 
whether it's things like focusing on breath work and your breathing and um, right up to kind of longer types of, uh, of relaxation type and um, exercises so I think that's a really helpful um, um, kind of site to, to have a look at and I'll, I'll pop it in the chat myself in, in, in a little bit but so bomo.ie forward slash mark mindfulness and relaxation center um, there are then kind of higher level services that people can avail of. So if people feel like, for example, that they're um, that they need more support than what a, a kind of a mild um, six to eight sessions might help them with. And um, again, people can avail of uh, adult mental health services and a &E, of course, in, in the case of any kind of emergency based um, kind of settings, including mental health uh, emergencies. Um, sometimes what, what we describe. Um, oh, thank you, Annie, for putting that in the chat. Uh, sometimes what um, people will, will come to us in the clinic and talk about is some of the kind of more behavioural support interventions that they might need. Um, and so typically this, this might be for, for maybe somebody who has either more of a frontal type of a stroke or maybe more of a, a severe stroke. Um, but these again are just some of the practical things that can be very helpful in terms of things like um, de-escalating a situation. Um, so these are helpful in, across the board. It, it's not necessarily stroke specific, um, but certainly these are things that can, can help. So kind of changing a setting where possible. So changing an environment or changing location or changing the demands of somebody. Um, and so that might look like, uh, what that might look like is if somebody is maybe out, um, maybe in a busy shopping center and all of a sudden that just gets really overwhelming, um, that the environment can change quite easily there and, and the person can you know head to a different quieter kind of a, a location. Um, the demands on them socially are changed, the demands on their attention system and their, their kind of brains are, are changed and reduced and it might help them to feel a little bit more, more relaxed. Um, we often talk about these kind of things like antecedents, which are essentially looking at triggers. So, so if you find, you know, for yourself or for, for other people, um, that there's a particular kind of behaviour um, that's uncomfortable for somebody as in they become quite stressed or distressed at certain points, um, what we often try and ask people to do is to, is to try to jot down triggers that, that might be a case for this um, so that we can help them then kind of unpick that and, and move around from it. Um, so things like distraction and um, stimulus changes work as well. So, so kind of moving somebody on to something else. Um, if, you know, sometimes people find themselves in situations that can be quite charged and quite um, emotionally charged and that might look like kind of aggression or anger or some of those kind of things. Um, and so sometimes that that's a, that can be as a result of the stroke, as you mentioned at the start. So that behavior change or that kind of frontal piece is, is more a symptom of the stroke and the recovery journey. Um, and so people sometimes do find themselves in those situations. And so it can be very hard, but but often what we try and recommend is that people kind of, you know, stay in that kind of non-threatening, kind of calm and reassuring kind of a, a space. If possible, depending on the situation, humor can sometimes be very good to diffuse a, a highly charged kind of situation. Um, but equally, remembering some of the some of the basics in terms of kind of you know simple, clear language at a really good kind of slow kind of pace, um, setting a tone. So so really trying to get into a grounded space to to engage in that. Um, and then afterwards, you know, post kind of an argument or a bit of a, a blow up. We often talk about this kind of like recovery space. So we talk about kind of the three hours, the kind of recovery, repair and reconnect. Um, so giving somebody a chance to come back and say, yeah, I probably, you know, I shouldn't have, you know, gone to 10 out of 10 on that situation. Having that kind of repair conversation where, you know, all is kind of forgiven or, or things are, are changed and then reconnect um, and kind of put that that micro kind of rupture behind you. Um, so there are th three of the kind of ors we talk about recovery, repair, and reconnecting. Um, in terms of cognitive difficulties, so again, from this more psychological, neuropsychological perspective, these are things that people find um, can, be, can be quite useful. So using things like reminders, using prompts for things like medication, keeping diaries and calendars, uh, smartphones are great for things like alarms and reminders. Um, in terms of helping people to remember stuff, we, we often talk about kind of rehearsal as a strategy. So kind of small bits of information again and again. So, so kind of repetition is, is key um, in, in some of those kind of things. Uh, breaking down information, so chunking. So for example, if I was about to call you at a mobile phone number to try and remember, 
you know, I probably wouldn't give you all nine digits. I'd give you the first three, you know, oh eight, whatever. And then I'd probably give you two or three, two or three kind of thing. Um, so, so chunking information can be a really nice way of, of helping the brain to, to scaffold it and get it in um, on a practical level. Visual images and associations work really, really well if people have a bit of a, a memory difficulty. Um, so again, that can be things like visual prompts, visual reminders, and then um, incorporating some of these things like stickies, for example, sticky notes, uh, whiteboards, they can be really, really useful if, if somebody has a bit of a, a difficulty with, with their memory or with getting new information in after, after a stroke. Um, what, what associations is referring to there is if you can kind of tie, link and tie two things together, um, you know, in terms of your, your kind of support. So that might be something like let's say maybe using reminders and prompts at the door so that somebody thinks then okay when I'm leaving the door do I you know when I'm going outside the house do I have my keys do I have my my wallet all that kind of stuff um so you start to build these associations so so when people eventually you know just go to the door without the prompt they'll remember the different things and then central points of, of information so that can again be um things like you know you yourself or, or somebody having a, a repository of, of info that they can kind of go to so they know okay I'm looking for A, B, and C. I know it's going to be over there, kind of thing. Um, so again, in just another couple. There should be a picture there. Yeah, um, another couple of pieces in terms of kind of recognizing and, and responding to stress, whether that's on a personal kind of self care level or whether it's supporting somebody else. Uh, some of these things here can be really, really useful. Um, I've popped in again the the, the mark link for the relaxation um, uh, center at True Beaumont. And some of the other um, resources that are available through the NHS and, and through the UK um, are really, really good. So I've put in a few links to, to those um, and, and put in a picture of some of these kind of things. Um, so again, it's largely looking at things like stress management and um, taking control of, of stressors that are within your control and trying to let go of the ones that aren't in, in your control, um, which is a very, very hard thing to do, but it's a skill that can be kind of developed over time. Um, so, so some kind of uh, some components there. Um, again, there are other community-based supports. I pop primary care in here again uh, at the bottom because I, I think you know it, it's just such a good service to be able to avail of, um, but people have to know about it kind of thing. Um, there are other kind of services that we will often also refer to from the clinic in terms of places like Headway, um, Quest, ABI Ireland, um, and again, just a few kind of resources there so, so people don't feel like they... Um, that you know there are there aren't kind of other other services available and that kind of thing. As I say, primary care is a brilliant service, um, and that's multidisciplinary. So people may have come across it um, already, but um, you know it's access to occupation therapy, speech and language therapy, psychology, and and other um, other other disciplines that's available through your through your GP. Um, again, the psychological side of things. Um, so again, these are just some of the typical things that, that will happen. So I, I kind of was trying to think like maybe de demystifying some of the what happens in the room kind of thing um, with, with the psychologist. Um, it's very much so a, a strength-based um, kind of formulation, trying to understand um, what's happened and what the impact of that has been. Uh, identifying stressors, anxiety, uh, fatigue is huge, as people will know post-stroke. Post it's one of the largest um, things that people, uh, difficulties people describe and talk to us about is post-stroke fatigue. Um, and through that, then, how do we kind of learn strategies to cope um, or how do we um, kind of work differently around some of the stressors and things that we have? Um, these are then just some other things that we do in terms of look at kind of diet or sleep, um, increasing exercise in a, in a way that's useful for a person where possible. Um, so looking um, so I'm going to kind of sign off there on the kind of on the slides front um, and just say thank you very much again for for listening. Um, and what we can do now is, is kind of continue the session as, as you normally would in terms of maybe a discussion or, or uh, questions and that kind of thing. So um, I'll stop the slideshow here and just thank you again for your, uh, for your time there with that.